just thank the Lord that God has brought Dave to be with us. So would you give him a good New Mexico welcome? Thank you. Thank you, thank you so, so much. much. Well, I tell you, it's my privilege to be here. I am happy to be in New Mexico. I uh, was here last 30 years ago. When I was a college student, a friend of mine and myself, we wanted to see America. So we got a hold of, uh, I went to Liberty University. A guy named Jerry Falwell started that university. He had a big mailing list of pastors. And uh, we got a hold of his mailing list. And uh, we uh, communicated with a bunch of pastors around America and set up a trip. Most of them were brand new church planters. And that's how God ended up calling me to be a church planter. But we traveled across America from upper state New York all the way across to uh, Washington State, down to Southern California, back through uh, New Mexico, Texas, and Tennessee. We literally preached 70 nights in a row. And it was during that that God called me to be a planter. And this is the truth. Uh, We went through Albuquerque. I can't remember the name of the church we were at, but uh, I thought Albuquerque was a great place. So I'm glad to be back. Now, I am in Las Vegas, Nevada. What is Las Vegas known as? Sin City. The name of my church is Grace City. And our passion is to see God change Sin City into Grace City. People ask me, uh, how did you get to Vegas? And the answer to that is this. I was teaching a class at Liberty Seminary. I'm a professor there on church planting, and we were in Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I was praying and uh, teaching that class, and when I made this statement, I said, I believe that if you learn to cooperate with Jesus in planting churches, you can plant a church anywhere and it will kick in the gates of hell. Right at that moment, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Do you really believe that, Dave? And I'm teaching the class, but I'm having this conversation with God. And I'm like, yeah, I believe that. And God said, find the gates of hell and plant a church. I am in Las Vegas, Nevada. Many of our church came, we were scouting out uh, two years ago whether or not God wanted us in Las Vegas. We met a brand new Christian. We were having lunch with him. And um, I said, why should I leave my job in, in, at Liberty University, my beautiful home in Virginia, all of our families on the East Coast? Why should I leave all that, leave uh, all those things, go to Las Vegas and start a church in Sin City? He said, well, I'm a brand new Christian, but I was reading the Bible this morning, and it said that where sin abounds, grace should abound that much more. How many believe God is big enough? I believe God is much bigger than we possibly can imagine. And I believe God is big enough to bring revival to every and any city in America if his people will just uh, go after it with all of our hearts. Um, Let me tell you real quickly just a bit about Grace City Church. We moved there um, almost two years ago. We started church in my house. We moved on uh, Saturday and started church on Sunday in my house there as well. We spent 30 days praying, six hours a day with the, the people that went there to plant with us. We were a parachute plant. We didn't know anybody in Vegas when we got there. We just dropped in. 30 days of prayer. We uh, needed to meet somewhere for worship eventually, so we prayer walked around to school uh, every day for a month a middle school that opened up to us and allowed us to meet there and now actually lets us have Bible clubs on campus and they announce it over the intercom, which is kind of amazing because uh, Las Vegas is run by Mormons and a lot of it. 
Um, then we started doing lots of outreach. We did at least one outreach event every weekend for two months. We eventually filled my house up, moved to the middle school. Now we outgrew the middle school. We're in a high school. We have about 300 people on Sunday mornings. We uh, have about 100 people in another campus on Sunday nights. We have about 50 uh, college students at UNLV on Thursday nights. So God is moving in Las Vegas. Now, there are some great churches in Las Vegas and some great uh, places in Las Vegas. We uh, were sent to the least reached part, the least church part of Las Vegas. Two zip codes in uh, South Central Vegas, right next to the Strip and around the airport. The first zip code, 89119, has 62,000 people. It's mostly college students, young adults, um, and very poor people and street people. 62,000 people, the total church attendance, if you added up all the uh, Christian churches in that zip code, 62,000 people would be less than 1,200 people. The zip code below that is 89123, 60,000 people. And the total uh, Christian church attendance there would be uh, less than uh, 1,300 people. So you've got 122,000 people. You've got 2,500 or less that attend church in a Christian church. We're in a needy place just like you are in a lot of needy places here. But we're seeing God do great things because God is big enough. Well, our church is all about, uh, we've got some slides there. Our church is all about three things. So uh, this is our motto, do hard things in tough places so God gets all the glory. Uh, We're all about three things, prayer, evangelism, and spiritual warfare that leads to revival. We take that very seriously. We believe that's the foundation of everything. Second, we're all about evangelism and mercy ministries, leading to a harvest of souls. Uh, Our passion is to see revival in the city of Las Vegas. We want to see God do such a thing that it's talked about all over the earth. You know, what happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas. We want God to do such a revival in that city that people are talking about it all over the planet. Right now, we have a move of young adults. About every two months, we have a family of young adults move to Las Vegas to become a part of our church because they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. When I say a harvest of souls, right now in the city of Las Vegas, in that county, the surrounding Uh, suburbs, there's 2 million people. Less than 100,000 are uh, Christians. That's less than 5%. Our passion is to see God double that number in the next seven years. Using us and all the the Christian ministries in Las Vegas, we want to see 100,000 people brought into the kingdom of God. How many think God is big enough? 1904 in Wales, 100,000 people were saved in one year. We're making it easy on God. We want to see it happen in seven years. The third thing we're all about is disciple being and disciple making leading to multiplication. Uh, We want a sustainable ministry that makes disciples, and I'm going to talk to you about that tomorrow. Well... Anybody in this room love the book of Acts? Can I see your hands? You love the book of Acts. If you got your Bible, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. And I want to give you the executive summary of the first church in history. Now, the book of Acts is the story of the first church in history on this planet. It's the tale of the church that God had in mind. I love it because it's the story of a bunch of imperfect people turning the world upside down. 
It describes the church as it should be. It describes the church as an unstoppable force. It describes the church on fire. Say, on fire. Oh, everybody, say, on fire. I want to see a church on fire. That's what I'm about. Describes a church that was created to change the world. It's a church that reached its city. One reason I, I'm so excited about the first church in history is they say that within the first 30 years of that church, that church itself had reached 100,000 Jewish people. Christianity, in the first 70 years of its existence, had reached 1 million people. That's one of the numbers uh, we were asked to write down, 1 million. And I believe God is big enough. Tell the person next to you, God is big enough. Let's read their executive summary of this first church. It says, so that then those who received his word were baptized, and there added to that day about 3,000 souls. Now, that's a pretty good day, wouldn't you say? And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. And then awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles goes on and says, and all who believe were together and had all things common. Let's go on. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and joyous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people And then the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, who doesn't want to be a part of a church like that, right? What a great church. That church uh, was balanced. I got a couple thoughts just that fit into this conference. Uh, Will you pull that up? Oh, sorry. Let me give you this. I got a couple big questions. Let me ask you these questions. If the church was born in Acts chapter 2, what was happening in Acts chapter 1? If the church was born in Acts chapter 2, what was happening in Acts chapter 1? Prayer. Let's go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 12. Acts 1 and verse 12. It says, and when they'd entered, Jesus had just ascended into heaven. It says, when they, that's the 120 the 12, the 72, and the ladies who were part of the, the, the ministry team, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, and the rest of the guys. And all these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer. Together with Mary and Martha, the mother of Jesus, his brothers, the company of the persons was about 120 people. I've got three observations for you out of this passage. One, we'll never have Acts 2 until we have Acts chapter 1. Whether you are revitalizing a church, listen to me, planting a church, you're pastoring, whether you're leading here in the denomination, you're never going to have Acts 2 until you have Acts 1. My church in Ohio, we started with 30 days of prayer. You're never going to have Acts 2 until you have Acts 1. Uh, There's a book back there on the table. It's about global church planning movements by David Garrickson. And he summarized and and analyzed where the the church is exploding exponentially, organically around the world. And he lists 10 factors. The number one factor in every church planning movement, listen to me, he says, is extraordinary prayer. I'll tell you, we need a church planting movement in North America. We need a church planting movement in Las Vegas. We need a church planting movement in New Mexico. We need a church planting movement among Hispanics. We need a church planting movement among the deaf. You're never going to have it until you have a prayer movement. 
Until the church is crying out to God, like the church in the book of Acts, we're never going to see God do the God-sized stuff. Second thought, if you want what they had, you've got to do what they did. Hey, I want the book of Acts. I want people saved every day. I want to baptize 3,000 people in one day. You're never going to have what they had until you do what they did. The third thought is first century believers live lives of prayer and fasting. Write down these two numbers, three and two. Every first century Christian uh, that was committed practiced three times a day prayer. I don't know if I have time to get into it tonight, but they prayed three times a day, morning, noon, and night, based on David and Daniel, evening, morning, and noon, three times a day prayer. They they went to the temple three times a day if they were in Jerusalem. Read Acts 2. They were at the temple during the morning time of prayer. Read Acts 3. They were going to the temple during the afternoon time of prayer. Read Acts uh, 10. Peter wasn't in Jerusalem, so he went on the rooftop for the noon time of prayer. That's three. Number two, the number two is this. They fasted two days a week. From sundown to sundown, they fasted two days a week. I met a lot of Baptists that looked like we could could, uh, stand to fast two days a week. Look, until we love revival, until we love Jesus, until we love souls more than we love food, we're not going to see revival. We're not going to see souls coming into the kingdom in mass groups. Look, if you want what they had, you've got to do what they did. They lived lives of extraordinary, we would call it extraordinary prayer and fasting. Let me ask you a a third question. How many of you believe that God can do things bigger than you can? Can I see your hands? You think God can do it bigger than you can? How about faster than you can? How about more long-lasting? How about better than you can? I came to the conclusion several years ago that if I really believe that God could do it bigger and better and faster and more long-lasting, my prayer life would reflect it. Now, I, I've pretty much always been an hour-a-day prayer guy, but the last few years I, I've tried to stretch into two and three hours a day of prayer. You say, why? Because I've discovered God's smarter than I am. I've discovered God's stronger than I am. I discovered that God loves with a passion that changes lives better than I do. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to cover all these. Let me uh, give you this one first. Prioritize your prayers in order to maximize your impact. Why was the book of Acts, why was the church so successful? Number one, because the disciples, the apostles, prioritized their prayers in order to maximize their impact. The very first thing they did was hold a prayer meeting. Seven days, I'm curious if it was 24-7. Part of the time they were in the upper room, and according to Acts 24, part of the time they went into the temple courts, probably during the three times of prayer. They prioritized prayer in order, (laughs) excuse me, to maximize impact. You know, when uh, Jethro told Mo- Moses how to shepherd a million people, he said, number one, you've got to stand before God in behalf of the people you've got to pray. When Jesus came to earth and started a movement that changed history, we find that first thing in the morning, he rose early in the day and went out to pray. We find him praying all night on many, many, many occasions. When Paul told Timothy how to pastor, the church of Ephesus, he says, uh, let's see what we got, pull it up. He says, first of all, in chronology and priority, first of all, 
I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Until we prioritize prayer, having more meetings isn't going to change anything. I said having more meetings isn't going to change anything. How do you think God could do things bigger than you can? How about better than you can? How about more long last? Let me ask you a serious question. Your prayer life the last month, does it reflect that? Or does it show that you think you can do it better than God? You can do it bigger than God. You can do it faster than God. A man named J.C. Ryle. He said, I've read the lives of many eminent Christians who've been on earth since Bible days. Some of them I see were rich, some poor. Some learned, some unlearned. Some Calvinists, some Arminians. But one thing I see they all had in common, they were all men of prayer. That quote uh, bugged me. I love biographies. I've got uh, about 100 of them now. I had about 75 at the time. And I went through and I studied 75 of of the world's most influential Christians. And I found out he was right. They do have one common denominator. It's not their age. It's not their education. It's not their personality. It's not their social status. It was their prayer life. We can start with Abraham and go all the way to Billy Graham, which is what I did. I studied 75 of them, and one of my publishers asked me to put it in a book, and actually I've got it back there at that back table. And I studied their prayer lives, and then how they prayed so that we can pray like they prayed. And I found that they indeed were men and women of prayer. Do you realize (laughs) that North America is the only continent without a church plant, a true church planting, organic, exponential church planting movement? Do you realize North America is where the church play, prays less than anywhere else in the world? Ezekiel 22. God said, I look for a man among them who built up the wall and stand before me in the gap of behalf of the land so I wouldn't destroy it, but I found none. This is talking about Israel going into captivity. I think those four words are are four of the most uh, sad words in the Bible. God was looking for an intercessor. God was looking for a prayer warrior, and he said, I can't find any. But I think they're also four of the most encouraging words in the Bible because one person who would have gone after it in prayer could have changed history. Tell the person next to you, change history. Look at the next verse, Psalm 106. Earlier, God was ticked off at Israel because of their rebellion, and this is what he said. He said, therefore, uh, this is what the psalmist said, therefore he said he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach. That's an Old Testament uh, statement for intercessory prayer, standing in the gap between God and man, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath. One man changed history. Look at me for a second. What if one person in this room said, by the grace of God, I'm going to change the history for my city. I'm going to change the history for my town. I'm going to change the history for my state. How many think God can do things bigger than you can? How about better than you can? How about more long-lasting? If you really believe that, you're going to have a prayer life that's going to start to reflect that. You say, Dave, uh, go ahead. You say, Dave, my theology, I'm an Arminian. Well, John Wesley said God will do nothing on earth except an answer to believing prayer. 
He said, but Dave, I'm a Calvinist. Does prayer really make a difference if God is sovereign? Well, what did John Calvin say? He said, words fail to explain how necessary prayer is. While God never slumbers or sleep, he is inactive as if forgetting us when he sees us idle and mute in prayer. So I don't care which side of the spectrum you're on. Read your Bible. Doesn't it say, ask and it will be given unto you? Seek and you shall find. I think it was E.M. Bounds said, God has put under his own motion, uh, placed himself under the law of prayer. He's obligated himself to answer the prayers of men. He's ordained prayer as a means whereby he will do things through men as they pray he would not do otherwise. You know what I find? The more I pray, the more I see God work. Let me ask you a question. How many think that if you prayed more the rest of this year than you prayed already, it would be a good thing? Can I see your hands? You know, nobody's ever died, I don't think, saying, I wish I'd prayed less. But I think a lot of people have died saying, I wish I prayed more. About 10 years ago, Billy Graham was being interviewed and uh, he was asked about his regrets. And he said, I have two regrets. One, I didn't spend enough time with my family. And two, I didn't spend enough time in prayer. We've got to prioritize prayer in order to maximize impact. Um, Go ahead. Keep going. Let me tell you about Tom. Uh, Every morning, my church prays from 9 to 1030 in the morning. There's 15 to 40 of us that gather. 9 to 1030 every morning. We also have prayer uh, gatherings on uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights. On Sunday, we worship at a school at 1030 in the morning, but at 930, we have our most important service, which is our prayer meeting. One morning, when we pray in the mornings, we've seen God deliver people from meth. We've seen God deliver people from demons, from depression. We've seen God do miraculous things. One morning, uh, we were praying and worshiping, and I felt my physical heart began to hurt. And I've learned that sometimes when I'm feeling pain, maybe that is God wanting to bring healing to somebody in that room. And I couldn't think of anybody that was having heart issues that was there. I wasn't. And a guy standing next to me said, hey, Dave, we need to remember to pray for Tom. He's having heart surgery next week. Now, this is Tom's story. He's a young father. He's a graduate of Liberty. He went, moved to Vegas several months ago just to be a part of our church. He's got three little kids. The last two years, he's had seven heart surgeries. Can't get his heart in rhythm. Has a pacemaker. On Wednesday, October 2nd, during our time of prayer, I felt God directed me to pray for him. So we all gathered around Tom and we all prayed that God would come and touch his body. I felt God directed me and I put my hand on his heart and I said, he had been in a lot of pain and I said, God, touch Tom's heart and take away the pain. I got done praying and Tom was smiling. He said, my heart stopped hurting. Next morning at nine o'clock when we got there to pray, pray, Tom came up to me and he said, my heart has not hurt any since we prayed yesterday. And I have to check the heart rate every so many hours. It's been in sync. 
for the whole last 24 hours. We were praying and worshiping. And my physical heart started to hurt again. And I'm like, God, do you want us to pray more? And he's like, yes. Don't just pray that Tom's heart stops hurting. Pray that it's completely healed. So we gathered around Tom and we all prayed for him. And I put my hand on his heart and I began to pray for him. That God would not only take away the pain and bring it in rhythm, but that his heart would be completely healed. That Sunday, that was Thursday, that Sunday at church, we, uh, at the, we do a lot of praying in my church during the worship service. And at the end of the, the invitation, we had two ladies that were going in for cancer surgery that week. And we had Tom come, who was going in on Monday for heart surgery. And we gathered around them and prayed that God would, would be God. And do God stuff. Well, Monday, uh, about lunchtime, my phone began to blow up with messages from Tom. And then about Monday afternoon, this is what he put on Facebook. This morning I went in for surgery. They discovered that my SVT, now SVT, uh, go back up. There's another slide up there. Is there one above that? Okay, no, that's us praying for them. What it said on Facebook is four weeks ago, my cardiologist had three path, said three pathways affected my heart rhythm and a very serious abnormality in my heart. Last Wednesday and Thursday, I prayed that God would radically heal me. And then this morning, they discovered that my, uh, the first thing they do prior to surgery is study to see exactly where the par- par- pathways are. They discovered my supraventricular tachycardia an inexplicable rapid heart rate, SVT is completely gone, and that I showed no signs of ever having it in any pathways. Beyond that, my heart is fully healed. My surgery was canceled because God had radically healed me before the surgery. This is a testimony of God's power. And he still does miracles. He said, I am living proof. Later that day, his brother, uh, who's an atheist, replied to that post on Facebook and said, you know, I don't believe in God, but I can't deny it. This is a God thing. When he went in for his one-week follow-up, the doctor came in shaking his head, and he said, there's nothing wrong here. I'm sorry. I don't even know why you were scheduled for surgery. He said, we usually would restrict your activities and have you come back every three months, but you can do whatever you want. You don't have to come back at all. The two ladies we prayed for went in for surgery, no cancer. How do you think God can do things bigger than you can? How about better than you can? How about more long-lasting? Now, I don't care if they're a new ager. I don't care if they're an atheist. I don't care if they're an agnostic. I don't care if they're a religious but lost Catholic. I don't care if they're a secularist. When God does God's stuff, God gets God glory. I have a challenge for you. You want to revitalize your church? Revitalize your prayer life. You want to plant a church? You want to plant the gospel in a community? Plant a prayer life in that community that invites God to do God-sized stuff. We've seen drug addicts People don't get delivered from meth or heroin like this. We've seen it happen. Look, everybody in this room, there's been a time, a point, a moment in your life when God wrote something in your life that he wanted to do through your life, in your life, for your life. 
If you're not realizing it right now, could it be because your prayer life is not shouting out, I believe, God, that you can do things bigger than I can. I believe that you can do things better than I can. I believe that you can do things more long-lasting than I can. If your church is not kicking down the gates of hell, could it be that your church isn't praying like the one in the book of Acts? You know, when the the church in Acts started to explode, the apostles pulled back and said, whoa, we've got to dedicate ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. We cannot lose that priority. I've been consulting with a denominations the last seven years about church planting. And actually, one reason I started church is I got tired of them of talking and them nodding their heads and not changing. Based on what we see globally, based on what we see biblically, you'll never have a church planting or a church revitalizing movement until you have a prayer movement first. And when you have a prayer movement, a true prayer movement, it will produce a true evangelism movement. And when you have a true evangelism movement, it will produce a true disciple-making movement. When you have that, you'll have all the churches you need. I'm 50-some years old. I made a decision a few years ago. I don't want to die without seeing revival in my lifetime. I don't want to die without seeing the book of Acts in North America. So whatever that looks like, whatever it takes, whatever I got to do to do my part so that God is, is free to do his part that he's longing to do. Look, doesn't the Bible say that he's not willing that any should perish? So that is the will of God. So if people are perishing, that's on us. That's on me. God is looking and longing for partners on the planet to show himself strong in our behalf. God is looking and longing for churches that will say, God, we want you to be God here and now in this city. God is looking for you. God is looking for you to say, okay, God, I'll get up a little earlier. I'll stay up a little later. A few months ago, I I felt there was a burden for about 10 things that were just way bigger than I could handle. I said, God, I don't even know in my schedule, when can I pray more? And God gave me a time, 3 a.m. You know, not a lot going on at 3 a.m. question is, how bad do you want it? What price will you pay? How many believe God can do things bigger than you can? How about better than you can? How about more long-lasting? Would you bow your heads? Now, I'm from Las Vegas where people are expressive. I think there's some people in this room probably, we need to just get on our knees right now. Say, God, help me. God, forgive me. God, use me. God, here am I. Send me. God, break me. God, bend me. God, whatever it looks like, whatever it takes... God, I want to love you more than food. I want to love you more than sleep.
God, there's so much good going on in this room. So much good. We pray you'd like light a match to all of that. Lord, we need, we don't need good, God. We need God. We need that stuff that only you can do. That stuff that you get all the credit for. God, hear us. 